All right, take your Bibles, would you please, and look with me in Mark chapter 4, and we're considering verses 35 through 41. I think it would be helpful uh, to really set the stage for this in the context of some things that are going on here. There's some tremendous truth to be seen. I must confess to you that uh, on Friday afternoon, uh, uh, Brother Anthony did a great job teaching a Bible lesson down at a Bible uh, club that we're holding down at the school on the corner, and when he was given the lesson, I was reminded of a particular statement that had been mulling around in my head, and it's one of those that sticks with, with you. Uh, such a powerful statement. Someone even wrote a hymn uh, and used this line in that hymn in the title of the song. It's found in verse 38. Master, carest thou not that we what? Carest thou not that we perish? Has anybody here ever wondered or felt like maybe you were perishing or going through something and you wondered, does the Lord care? Is the Lord mindful of this? Do others care? Is anybody else uh, in tune with what I'm experiencing or what I'm feeling? That's a human experience, right? I mean, that's where we live, right? And so this passage of Scripture does a great job, I believe, and, and lands a couple of really good points, and I think they're just tremendous foundation for that statement. I would like to draw these points out today, and I believe be a help to you. Could we pray? And then we'll begin. Father in heaven, thank you again for your goodness. Lord, direct our thoughts, and uh, Lord, just really bring our, our heart, hearts into captivity to your word to be helped today. And we trust, Lord, that you'll do something here for us in this. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. This particular situation is not only given to us in the Gospel of Mark, but we also read of it in Matthew chapter 8 and Luke chapter 8 as well. And we get a few other little bits and pieces there of information to go along with it. But it's sufficient here to establish some things here in the Gospel of Mark today. And so we'll stay parked right here. I want you to see verse 35. Look at Mark chapter 4 and verse 35, and I want you to see the first four words. And the same what? Same day. What a day the Lord Jesus had had. Let me tell you some things that had taken place in that day. First of all, the Pharisees, there were two groups of people in the Lord's time who he, you will find continually him having opposition with. There are the Pharisees and the Sadducees. We'll not break down who they are per se, but we'll just mention that to you. So some of these folks had come to him and they were actually saying that the Lord Jesus was performing miracles because he was empowered by Beelzebub. Beelzebub's a fancy name for the devil. Satan. And we believe in a real devil, don't we? We believe in a real Satan. And there is a real devil, a real Satan. The Bible speaks of this, this person or individual, this being that God created, a fallen angel. And uh, they were saying that Jesus was performing miracles through the power of the devil. How insulting that must have been. Then we know also, as we are put a little time into digging this passage out, that his own family had come to him. His ministry was getting started and was becoming known, and some of his family member and friends had come to him, in a sense, trying to help him and trying to redirect him because he thought he might be mad, or he might be, the description is used in verse 21 of chapter 3, he is beside himself. How many of you have got a crazy relative? Don't answer that. You may be that crazy relative, all right? How many of you ever had a crazy relative at a get-together and you thought to yourself, hey, we need to get to crazy so-and-so, all right? Not, I'm not going to use a name, all right, because undoubtedly I will put your relative's name there, and I don't want to do that. I don't want to offend you that way. Call him Crazy Todd. How's that? I'll be the crazy relative for that example. And I could see getting together with some folks. You know, I remember when uh, some of my daughters were dating, and uh, they would bring somebody to the house. They would look at me, and they would say, Dad... And I would say, what? <laughs> I got a big backyard and shovels and fresh, fresh mounds back there. What's there to be concerned about? Now I might look and say, hey, Dad, you know, behave yourself. Now I remember on a couple of occasions behaving myself, but having some pretty frank and, and or direct conversations with folks. And I could see where maybe one of my children would say, Dad, don't embarrass us. Dad, don't do that, right? And so there was concern there from Jesus' family members. That, hey, he's beside himself. He's lost his mind. So this is the day that Jesus has had. He's dealt with people who accused him of being empowered by the devil. He's dealt with Pharisees. He's dealt with his family members and those that would come to him. And then the Bible says that the multitudes had pressed upon him so much. Listen how it's described here. Verse 20 of chapter 3. And the multitude cometh together again so that they could not so much as eat bread. There's so much going on in that day for Jesus and those that are with him, his disciples. There's great 
uh, oh, frustration, perhaps one might say, with the, what's being said about him. There's also then the family members coming saying he's beside himself. But then there is just the push of life, so much so that they're not able to get a bite of bread. How are you when you don't get your lunch? I've been around some of you when I thought to myself, hey, he needs a snack. He needs something to eat. All right, he needs a sandwich. And Brother Ron knows that about me too, all right, Brother Ron? We get to work and we say, we need to eat something. And so Mrs. Eckert is very good to bring a sandwich over for Brother Ron and for the pastor, right? We get grouchy when we don't get fed. How many of you get grouchy? I'm, I'm teasing, okay? Maybe not. Okay, how many of you get grouchy when you, yeah, huh? How about when you walk through the door? Even though you told your wife you'd be home at four and you didn't come home at four and you came in later than that and you walked through the house and you said, hey, Where's dinner? I mean, what are we having tonight? And she says, you I fed it to the dog. I fed it to the cat. It was on the table at four. Where were you? No, that's not what she says. Uh, hey, where's it at? They hadn't been able to eat that day. Let me tell you what this passage exposes here. I'm just having a little fun with you because your body is telling you that it's really 10 o'clock right now and not 1130, right? So we're talking about sleep in this passage right here. Uh, hey, let me tell you. This passage exposes two things about Jesus. Number one, it exposes his humanity. Jesus was all man. It starts out with that. He has had some day. The Bible says, And the same day when the even was come, he, Jesus, saith unto them, Let us pass over to the other side. The next verse tells us that they were already in ships, and so they began to sail across the Sea of Galilee. We'll lead further into the passage, and we'll find out that while they're sailing, Jesus is doing something. What is he doing? He's sleeping. He's sleeping on a pillow. Mike the pillow man. No. Come on, you're a tough crowd here, gang. Huh? He got a pillow there and he's sleeping. Now listen. Hey, this speaks to the humanity of Jesus Christ. Hey, what a God we have that he would come to us. We love him because he first loved us. What a God we have that he would step in and walk amongst us. What a great high priest Jesus is that he is able to understand and relate to us when we come to him because he has dealt with and faced what you and I are dealing with and facing on a daily basis. The Bible says, and it's very clear to tell us this in the book of Hebrews, that he was in all points tested. He was in all points tempted. He understands what it's like to be falsely accused. He understands what it's like to have his family think he's crazy. He understood what it was like to be pressed upon and not to be able to have even personal space to be able to eat lunch that day. He had had quite a day. He got into the ship and he said, guys, let's cross over. And while you do that, I am going to go and I'm going to take a nap. I'm going to get some sleep. Boy, think about that for a moment. There are those today, this morning, your goal this day is to just stay awake in church today, right? Because we get sleepy. We get tired. Some people struggle with issues that causes them, unfortunately, to fall asleep. And we fight that. Hey, how many of you remember when you used to be able to stay up late and get up early and have all the energy and all the strength you needed to get everything done that you wanted to? How many of you remember that? Yeah. What happens over time is increasingly we lose that, don't we? Huh? And, man, when I was a kid, on Sunday afternoons, there was a dirty word that was mentioned right after lunch. The dirty three-letter word it starts with an N. It was the word nap. How many of you as a child remember taking a nap on Sunday afternoon? Man, my dad would bring that out, and we would look for everything in the world, every strategy. We would begin plotting on the way home. How are we going to avoid taking a nap today? What are we going to do? What's our strategy to avoid this nap? And then nap would come. And now you know what happens on Sunday afternoon for me? I go home, and I say to everybody around there, I don't care what you do. You can... You, you, you can go to the moon and back, but here's, here's what I'm getting ready to do. I'm getting ready to walk up those stairs. I'm getting ready to shut my eyes. I don't care if it's for 30 minutes or 10 minutes, but I need a, I need a nap, right? Boy, we think of that. We remember days when we had energy and strength and we didn't need that rest. Consider that Jesus entered into this world and took on flesh. Needed a woman to nurture him. Needed a woman to hold him and to wrap him in swaddling clothes. Helpless as a baby. Humble. And yielded like a lamb. He had a day. He got into the ship with the guys. He said, I'm going down there to sleep. You guys, we're going to cross over. They were on a body of water called the Sea of Galilee. 
The Sea of Galilee is about 13 miles long at its longest point this way, and it's about seven and a half miles wide at its widest point. The amazing thing about the Sea of Galilee is that the banks of the Sea of Galilee are 680 feet below sea level. That whole region from Mount Hermon that runs out to the Jordan River to the Sea of Galilee and then from the Jordan River down into the Dead Sea is a part of something called a rift. It is a place where the earth can shift and has uh, breaks between the different crustaceans of the earth. It's a crazy place when you look at the topography of what happens there. And that's why people would get in a ship and say, hey, we're going to take this little jaunt across and not know that a storm could pop up very quickly, could pop up from behind that mountain. And very quickly, what seemed to be a good journey, good travels, turned into a very dangerous situation. And so the Bible tells us that there are things that will take place. Verse 37, And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship so that it was now what? Full. Wasn't half full. The Bible is saying that it was full. And the Bible speaks of Jesus in verse 38, that he was in the hinder part of the ship asleep on a pillow. And they awake him and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? I say to you, number one, this passage reveals the humanity of Christ. That he had had a day and he needed sleep. I say to you, number two, this passage reveals the deity of Jesus Christ. The deity. Humanity and that he needed sleep. The deity and that when he was awakened from his sleep, he stood up and he went out. And what did he do? He said to the wind and to the waves, peace, be still. And the Bible says that the wind ceased and there was a great calm. Sometime read Psalm 107. Sometime read Psalm 84. Both of these passages speak of God and God's power and God's ability to calm the waves, to cause the wind to cease. Only God could do what Jesus did. You can walk out today and look at the sun and command the sun to do something. You can walk out today and command the rain clouds. Boy, did we have some rain on Friday. Was it Friday or Thursday? I don't remember. One of those days we had it and it were, the rain was coming up and the floodwaters were coming up. And I stood in my driveway and I said, I rebuke you, rain. You shall not enter in to my basement this time. And guess what happened? It still made its way and I had to block it off and keep it. I can't control the weather, huh? Only one could do that. Only one could step up and say, hey, knock it off. Hey, straighten up. I think it's in there somewhere. You woke me up for all this? Go to sleep. Leave me alone. Settle down. Now look, what did he express there and demonstrate to his disciples that he was whom? God. That's the humanity, that we have a Savior that would come to us. And that's also a Savior who is God. Let me tell you something, it's a fundamental doctrine. It's a doctrine that you must accept, that you must receive, and that is that Jesus is God. You must now you might think today that the majority of the people in the world believe that. They don't. The majority of the people in the world do not believe that Jesus is God. They may believe that Jesus existed. They may believe that Jesus walked on the earth. They may believe that Jesus was a good man, a good prophet, did a lot of good things. They may even believe that Jesus died on a cross. But a majority of the people in the world today, the Islamic world does not believe that Jesus is God. The Buddhist world does not believe that Jesus is God. And quite honestly, I believe that many people who would take the name Christian don't even really accept that Jesus is God. This is an important thing. Because in order for me to know God, I must know Jesus Christ. There is one God and one mediator. And we must understand that this mediator is God. And we do. And we rejoice in that today. So at the beginning of this passage, we see the humanity of Christ. At the conclusion of this passage, we see the deity of Christ. And in the middle of this passage, we see us. We see the nitty-gritty of life. We see it. There's emotion there. Here are men who, many of them, had spent their life on or near the Sea of Galilee. They had made their living, in some cases, fishing. They knew very well what happens when a ship gets full of water. What happens? It sinks. It sinks. Years ago, I went fishing with an old-timer. We got in this old rickety boat of his. He had talked me into going fishing. I don't, they didn't have to talk real hard, but we went. We got in this boat, and at the front, he had a coffee can tied to a string. 
And at the back, he had a coffee can tied to a string. I said, what, what's up with the coffee cans? He said, I don't want to lose them. I said, why don't you want to lose them? He said, well, we may need them. I said, what would we need them for? We may need them to get the water out of the boat. <laughs> what in the world, man? I don't know about this. He said, don't worry about it. I know how much we can take on. So we were out fishing along. I'm looking down, and water starts out a little bit. It begins to slosh up around my feet. My feet I can begin to feel my feet getting wet. My socks are getting wet. I grab the coffee can. I begin to put a little bit out. I said, hey, you think maybe you ought to... Because, you know, the, it's getting deeper in the back than towards the front, and I'm in the front. He said, oh, we got plenty of time. I said, oh, yeah, man, you know. It means, you know, what do you mean? He said, listen, I've done this time or two. I know how much water I can take on before I'll begin to sink. I am never fishing with that guy again. <laughs> Ain't happening, right? One time I climbed, went on a visitation visit on a Thursday night, and the gentleman that I visited had his pilot's license, and he had a plane. And he said, would you like to go for a trip? Or would you like to fly real quick? I said, man, that's a great idea. Didn't ask anybody, didn't really think about it. Got up in this airplane, called my wife. <laughs> called my wife from the airplane. said, honey, I'm flying all over Greenwood right now. She said, you're what? I'm flying all over Greenwood. With who? I said to the guy, I don't know who that is. I said, well, I'm, I, she said, man, I, I, I understand this. You are in an airplane with somebody that I don't know. You have children at home and you're flying in it. What are you doing? What are you thinking? And I got out of that thing and talked to say, hey, listen, you know, you can't live in fear. The very next week, good man, good pilot, saved, everything fine with it. But the very next week, he had a hiccup with that airplane and had to crash land that airplane. It made the newspaper. His plane was on its nose. My wife got a hold of that newspaper. <laughs> huh? So listen, I'm not getting in boats with coffee cans tied onto them, and I ain't flying with you either, son. All right, I've learned my lesson. Then these men see this happening. The natural man says, we're going under. We're going to sink. We're not going to make it. Like we got to, hey, what are we going to do here? Go and get the master. It was his idea that we cross over. Go and get him and wake him up. Jesus is there. He's sleeping. And they wake him up. And what does he say to them? Why are you so what? Why are you so fearful? Why do you not have faith? What, what, what's going on here? What's happening here? Remember, this passage opens with the humanity Aren't you glad that we have a Savior who can be reached? Aren't you glad that we have a Savior who would wake up and communicate with us? Because I must confess to you, if I was Jesus, I might have just said, leave me alone. I'm sleeping here. We're going to be fine. You know why we're going to be fine? Because I'm going to Calvary. I'm not going to die drowning in the middle of the Sea of Galilee. There's nothing to be afraid of here. I have a purpose. I'm the one who put us in the ship. I'm the one who told us to cross over. I've got this under control. But the natural man says, it's not under control. We're taking on water. Do something. Look at the Lord's response to this. And he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, peace be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, why are ye so fearful? And how is it that ye have no faith? Hey, listen. Storms come, don't they? Storms come suddenly. Storms can be fierce. They can have tremendous severity at times. There are things that happen that we're not prepared for. The ship was now full. Hey, have you ever said to yourself in life, I'm full, I've had it. How many have ever said this before? I can't take any more. No more. No more water. No more water in the ship. I'm, I've reached my max. And the storm that came up was severe. It was sudden. And it was a, a creating, this storm was creating a second storm. He's that first storm we all deal with. The Bible says that the rain rains on the just and the... Hey, good people, godly people, people who love the Lord, go and have doctor's appointments and find out that they have cancer. Cancer's mean, it's ugly. Issues, health issues. These things come. Hey, good men, godly men, godly ladies, go into work and find out that their plant has shut down. Or go in and find out that their office that they've been working in is no longer needed. People lose jobs. People have health problems. People have financial setbacks. Hey, I have stood before at the graveside with some of the finest young families that I've ever known. And I've wept with them as they laid little ones into the ground. And I have thought to myself, of all the people in the world, God, there are people who have babies and leave them in dumpsters. There are people who have such lack of concern for this that it's just a, a second thought to them. Why, God? 
You see, friend, we are living in a world that is under something. It's under a curse. Sin entered in and death entered in, and with it came all the storms that come. Sometimes we create our own storms, sometimes through our own behavior. I fear that today our society, our culture, our nation is creating our own storms. I heard recently that they're concerned that Russia and China are figuring out technology to be able to create storms. Listen, let me tell you something. They ought to fear the one who controls the storms. They ought to be more concerned with God, our creator, and what God sees. Sometimes we have storms that we've created. Sometimes we have storms that just simply come as life and a consequence of life. That first storm enters into all of our lives. But there's a second storm in this passage as well. And that's the storm that rages in here. The natural man says the boat is full. It's going to sink. The natural man says we're going to make it across. Go get the master. Why did, it, why did they feel that way? Let me share with you just a couple of thoughts. One, I think that they doubted his goodness. And sometimes storms will do that in our life. Now, the Lord Jesus hadn't put them in that ship, and they weren't following him. They had recently been called to be his disciples. He had not called them for the purpose of drowning them in the middle of the Sea of Galilee. I'm reminded of Israel, when Israel was brought out of Egypt. And when they would enter into storms or situations in life, oftentimes they would say, it would have been better off for us if we had what? Stayed in Egypt, then we wouldn't have to deal with this. Don't doubt God's goodness. God is good all the time. God is good all the time. In everything, give thanks. Why? For this is the will of God. This is what God has for your life concerning you. You say, but preacher, it's tough. And those storms are tough. But we're not exempt from storms. But God's good. Don't doubt his goodness. I think they might have even doubted his grace, his favor for them. We perish. We perish. They weren't perishing. They were just in a ship that was full of water. But understand something. The Lord Jesus, who could cause the, the blind to see, the deaf to hear, the lame to walk, could cause a full boat to float. Help us, Lord. We're going to perish. They doubted his goodness. They doubted his grace. I wonder if he even maybe didn't think about his guarantee. What was the guarantee that he gave? Let us pass over Unto what? The other side. He'd already told them we're going to go over to the other side. We may go over wet and soaking in a boat full of water, but we're going to go over because I'm in the boat with you. And friend, you may make it through life at times seemingly dry, but I assure you there are times when our boat is full and we feel like we're soaked. Let me remind you of something. He is with us. He's with us. You don't have to be afraid. You can trust him. You know, I am not fault them because, as I said before, the beginning of this passage is the humanity of Christ, and the conclusion of it is the deity of Christ, and then the middle is the nitty-gritty of life. Because I, too, have been overwhelmed before by things. I, too, have been caught off guard suddenly by something coming into my life or into the life of somebody else. I, too, have felt that rain beating down on my face and felt the wind there not expecting it and then have to deal with that. And that's when that storm begins to kick off. And that's where in our hearts, friends, we have got to be prepared to be settled. Settled in what? He is God. His humanity tells me that he cares enough for me to come to him. And his deity reminds me that he is God enough to put down the storm or to give me the strength to get through the storm. I see that there was a purpose in the storm. I believe that the purpose of the storm was really to teach them more about who Jesus is. To teach them that he is God and what he's capable of. Why are you so fearful? And how is it that you have no faith? How do you respond when storms come your way? When you begin to have crisis in life. Now remind you, that will remind you of this. That what is a storm to one is a shower to another. Right? Those of you that have lived through storms, a real storm, you know what it's like when there's just a little wind kicking up, right? And in life, there are people who have, and it's not an age thing. I know young people who have endured storms of life and were soaking wet, 
well before they were in, even in their adulthood. And sometimes we live lives where seemingly we get through without a whole lot. But I believe this will come for all of us. No matter how, the severity, however you gauge the, the severity. In the hurricane season, what do they do? This is a five, this is a four, this is a three, this is a two, this is a one. I don't care what it is, it's a hurricane. It's a storm, man. Wind blowing, you know. Uh, making me a little bit nervous. So, but the other night we had some thunder and lightning, didn't we, Tuesday night? I was helping a young man work on his car, and I did not stop to look and see what the forecast was. I thought the rain was over on Tuesday. So Tuesday evening, about 6 o'clock, 6.30, he pulls his car in on the driveway. I said, well, he'll work on it right there. It'll be fine. Jack the thing up in the air, take the tire off, bust the front end loose, and guess what happened on Tuesday night? It is pouring down rain. I'm out there helping this young guy out. He's got an umbrella up over my head. And I'm up underneath there turning this and doing that. And then all of a sudden, God sent a message to my yard. And I said, we're done for a while. His eyes were this big because he was the one holding the umbrella. I said, man, we're waiting this one out. We're done. We're going to take a break here. We'll come back when it's done. And a couple hours later, it cleared up, right? And these storms come. They come up suddenly unexpectedly. But how do you respond? Let me give you a couple things you to respond to. Number one, embrace the Lord. Embrace the Lord. Embrace Him. Know that He loves you. Know that He cares for you. Know that He's good. Know that His grace is sufficient. Don't question that. Jesus is on board with them. They're going to be okay. Are you saved today? Do you know that you're saved? Boy, that's a, what an unbelievable thought, isn't it? To know that I'm at peace with God, to know that there I've passed from death unto life. Hey, if this morning you could not share with us today your salvation experience or time when you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, you recognize yourself as a sinner under the condemnation, under the judgment of God, and then you look to Jesus realizing that He died on the cross to make atonement for our sins. And He didn't just die, He was buried and He rose again. Well, that faith of saying, I believe that. Look, like the disciples who saw the risen Savior, they looked upon Him, and like people who hadn't believed Him before, they saw the risen Savior, and they couldn't argue with that. They said, listen, He is who He said He is. He did what He said He would do, and He lives like He promised He would. I believe that that was for me. Man, as a junior high boy, it all came together, and I didn't verbalize it this way, but in my heart, this is what I said. I believe that that was for me. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. For with the heart, man, what believeth unto righteousness, with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. Hey, I believed it, and I want the world to know it. Hey, he saved me. He died for me. He rose for me. He lives for me on my behalf, and I'm saved, and I know it. And if you don't have that confidence today, you need to get that settled. Because you're going to face storms in life. And the very thing that's going to hold you up is that knowledge of knowing that you're saved and that the Lord is with you and that He's got a purpose and a place for you. And when that storm comes, well, hey, you know, that, that means this. They could have let the Lord sleep all the way through, crossed all the way over, got out wet. They'd have made it. But the humanity of the Lord allowed them to come to them and speak to them. And He stepped up and He helped them. And aren't you glad today that we have a Savior who gives us these instructions? Casting all your care upon Him. Why? He cares for you. It's not a question. He tells me He does. So man, when that storm comes and that lightning begins to crash and the rain begins to come down and the winds begin to blow and you feel yourself very quickly becoming overwhelmed. Stop! Run to Him! Lord, I trust you. Lord, I don't know how you're going to see me through this, but I believe that you can, and I believe that you will. Have faith. Don't be fearful. You know, anxiety and worry will rob you of your joy. There's a lot of anxious people in the world today. A lot of anxiety. Quite honestly, I think that there are people who really have struggles that way. And I think other times there are people who've heard other people talk about it so much, it's made them anxious hearing other people be anxious. I get around some people that worry all the time, and I start worrying about stuff I didn't even know about. <laughs> I had to stop reading the National Enquirer. Every time I read it, I got worked up about something, you know. 
wolf boy was going to come snatch me away to live with Bigfoot somewhere out west, you know. There are so many things that you could be anxious about. There are so many things that you could worry about. You could spend every day of your life worried and anxious. Why don't you just trust that Jesus is on board and he's going to safely bring you where he's headed to? Let me say this to you in closing. They left some place called Capernaum. Capernaum is where they were at. Capernaum was called this. That name means village of comfort. Village of comfort. There were springs there. People would go there for medicinal purposes, for aches and pains, and they would sit in those. That's one of the reasons why they think that Jesus' ministry largely took place there because sick people were coming there anyhow. There would have been a lot of people there looking for help and looking for answers. How many of you have ever been to a hot spring before? How many of you have ever been to Hot Springs, Arkansas before? I have. How many of you want to go back? We'll send you. All right. Oh, those hot springs, man, with the mineral waters. Even down in Martinsville, the Martinsville mascot is the Artesians. Pretty fancy. I had to look up what an Artesian is after I read their mascot. Hey, they get down in those hot springs and they sit there and they find comfort there. That's what Capernaum was, a place of comfort. Uh, an early historian even wrote that one time he had an ache and a pain and he went to Capernaum to try to find relief and spent the night there for that. They left a place of comfort. They crossed the Sea of Galilee. Mark chapter 5 tells us where they ended up. They ended up at a place called Gadara. Gadara was the place of the Gadarenes. But there's a particular person that Jesus will encounter in Mark chapter 5. He is the maniac of Gadara. Gadara means this, reward at the end. Reward at the end. Hold on a second. They left a place of comfort. They traveled through a storm. The Lord revealed himself in a greater way to them in the midst of that storm. And they ended up at a place where there was what? Reward. You know what storms do in our life? They bring us through. They move us out of our comfort zone. Nobody would leave a place of comfort to go through something. If it were up to us, we'd never have a problem. We would want that for our young people. We do everything we can to try to avoid having problems. We desire comfort. Hey, this is a natural man. The natural man says, I want to be as comfortable as possible. I want my house to be as comfortable as possible. I want my car to be as comfortable as possible. I certainly need shoes. Amen? Ladies, don't give up comfort for looks. Comfort is where it's at in your footwear. Can I get an amen? amen. Come on, you're killing me here. You don't leave a place of comfort to go to a storm. But when you do, you pass through and you end up with what? Reward. Reward. What was the reward? A greater understanding of who Jesus is. Notice what the Bible says. Verse 39, And he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? Verse 41, And they what? Feared what? Exceedingly. And said, one to another, what manner of man is this? Who is this? Well, we know who it is, right? The psalmist had told them who this is. This is God. This is God. He is here amongst us. What manner of man is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? There's the reward, a greater understanding of Jesus Christ. We sing songs like this. What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. But how many believers really live that? How many of us, it's not until we hit the storm and we get tossed in and the boat gets full that we don't start crying out to the Lord. But I'm afraid that if we didn't have some storms in our life, we would have a very inexperienced prayer life. We sing songs like this. Every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. Every day with Jesus, I love him more and more. It's a song to us. It's the storm of persecution. It's the storm of criticism. It's the storm of having to take a stand and moving forward for what's right that endures our heart to Him. 
I come to the garden alone. Oh, what a beautiful hymn. Do you go to the garden with Jesus? Do you go to the garden in prayer? Do you go with Him in those moments? You see, storms in life and problems and our little apple cart getting upset, it pushes us to go deeper into that, to rest, recognize that He is a Savior who can be touched. He is a Savior who cares who I can come to. But friend, He is not just that. He is God also. And He is a God who has given His Word. He is a God who has given His promise. And when He says it, it'll be so. And when He says, let's get in the boat, let's cross over, take it to the bank, we're getting through this thing. And let me tell you about your storm in life. I don't know how you're going to get through it, but I know who is going to get you through it. And the worst thing that this old sinful world has to throw at us, death. Oh, death, where is thy sting? Oh, crave, where is thy victory? Like the great evangelist John R. Rice said one time when he got in an elevator, a young guy pulled out a gun to rob him. And he said, son, you can't scare me with heaven. Now, I don't want people pulling guns on me. And I'm saying that was his response. It wouldn't be my response because I... I know karate. <laughs> all right, my response would be, here, man, whatever you got, take it, you can have it all. I ain't dying over this. It ain't worth it, man. Have it, right? But the reality is that, that, is it not? What have we got to be fearful and anxious of? We can trust the Lord. We can go to Him. And we have these promises. What a day it had been, and the same day. What an evening. What a boat ride. But what an experience of who our Savior is. Aren't you thankful today for Jesus? Aren't you thankful that you know who He is? Do you know Him as your Savior? Let's pray. Father in heaven, our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. We come to You, Lord, with our hearts humbled before You. Lord, desiring Your Word, desiring truth in our life. Lord, we do have storms. We do have situations that come upon us and move us and stir us. Sometimes quickly, quickly and sometimes unexpectedly. Sometimes, Lord, we see the storm brewing and coming our way. Lord, you know what we're facing. Lord, in all these things, you're good. Your grace is sufficient. In all these things, Lord, you're powerful. Thank you that you are a high, high priest that can be touched. We're thankful, Lord, that you did come and live amongst men, that you're able to secure us, you're able to help us, you're able to come alongside of us. But Lord, help us also to grow in our faith, to take our anxieties and our worries, bring them to you and to trust you. Lord, you gave the command, let's go across. That was sufficient. Lord, help us to consider your trustworthiness and your faithfulness in our lives. Our heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Who would say, preacher, today there was something in that for me and my life, maybe in preparation. Some of you are going through storms. You're dealing with things now. I get it. Isn't it good to know Jesus? Isn't it good to know who he is and his, have confidence in him? Not in ourselves, but in him. Who would say, preacher, there was sure something in that for me today. Please pray for me, preacher. Would you lift your hand? Anyone like that this morning? Father in heaven, you see our hands and you know our needs. Who's here this morning to say, Preacher, I don't know for sure that I'm saved and on my way to heaven. I don't know that. I could not stand up today and express to everybody that I know that I have eternal life like the Bible teaches me that I can know. The Bible gives it to us very expressly that we can know that. That is something that I can have confidence in. Not because of who I am, not because of what I've done, but because of who Christ is and what he's accomplished on our behalf. When we by faith receive him, we can have hope and we can have confidence in Christ. Who's here this morning? You'd say, Preacher, I don't know that I'm saved. Preacher, please pray for me as the Lord works in my heart in that matter about being saved. I don't know that I'm on my way to heaven when I die. Please pray for me. Would you lift your hand? Anybody like that today? Do you find yourself afraid at the slightest of things? Do you know the Lord? Do you know Jesus Christ as your Savior? Perhaps knowing him today would help you. I believe it's the starting place. I believe it's the foundation that we would lay upon, we build upon our faith in Christ. If you're here this morning, you don't know Christ is your Savior, I, I, I wish you'd let somebody, one of the men, one of the ladies in the church, open the Bible and share the gospel with you. Right there at your seat today, if you know that you're a sinner and you need a Savior, it's a matter of turning to Christ and saying, I believe, I believe Jesus that you lived and died and rose again for my sin. I believe you're the only way to God through your work on Calvary. You could be saved today.